This is the coming revolution in higher consciousness. Listen now to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, educator, author, and authority on the most exciting story of our time, the coming revolution in higher consciousness. We choose wholeness for life because we have made the a priori choice which Moses gave to us. Choose life, not death. His final and most important message to us before he passed to other octaves of light. Consider what this means. We think that choosing life, not death, is a straightforward and a concrete choice. But you see, each time we choose something less than life, or light, or the holiness unto the Lord, we in fact are compromising that life and therefore choosing death. Any indulgence in the concept of self that is less than that Christ is a choice for death. Any choice to let go of the emotions and to flounder and to allow ourselves to go under in self-pity or anger, to give in to the forces, whether of insanity or any others, the giving in to the first step on the degeneration spiral is a choice of anti-life. It culminates today as we see the wave of teen suicide in America, an unthinkable, unpredictable outcome, yet not so. It is predictable, for life has been denied already, and suicide, whether physical or spiritual, is the culmination of many choices along the way. The squandering of the life force in the chakras, the taking of various types of drugs for the altering of consciousness. Each one of these is a surrender of a precious commodity called life. And what is life? Life is the sacred fire blazing upon the altar of your heart, or should be. That divine spark, that threefold flame you were given from the beginning, it is the point of life, and to choose it is to love it, to obey it, to amplify, to expand, to nourish it, to glorify the name of God in it, and to have a cup of sacred fire that runneth over for one's friend, the family, the stranger, to offer oneself and one's portion that another might have wholeness for life. We are in the midst of a tremendous revolution it is the coming revolution in higher consciousness. Why do we say it is coming? We are not procrastinators. We know it is here. It is coming like the river of life descending. It is perpetually dawning upon us. It is flowing into our being. And with the experience of this revolution, this acceleration of light within our temple, we know that our God is nigh. We know the meaning of the second coming of Christ. We know its definition is the coming of the Lord, our righteousness of Jeremiah, into our temple to live. We know we were created to be more than hollowed out ones without any light or fire or message or self-determination. We were not created to be mannequins or robots to join the race of mechanization man. We were created that the Most High God could inhabit this temple, and if he does not inhabit our temple, then we are not fulfilling our reason for being. And if the mosques and synagogues and churches of the world and their pastors and priests and rabbis are not teaching us how to be infilled with the mighty presence of God, then they are not fulfilling their reason for being. And they must go to the same fount and first be cleansed that they might cleanse others, first be healed that they might heal others. This is the day of the Lord. 
It is the acceptable time. It is also the day of the vengeance of our God. It is very clear we see on the horizon great light appearing, the inner knowledge of the universal Christ. And we see the plagues descending. And what is the vengeance of our God? It is not his anger, it is his eternal law. The security of the law of cause and effect that returns to our doorstep, that which we have sent out. And we must deal with it. And this is the law of karma. And karma becomes our teacher. We have created a guru fashioned out of our own image and likeness for all of our deeds and words and works. They have gone forth and as they return to us, it is not for punishment, but for teaching. Thus we went the way of self-determination, imitating the angels of light who descended in a declaration of independence from Almighty God. We followed after them because they were glamorous, they were enticing, they offered instant beauty, instant everything, success and knowledge as the gods. And after a while, we decided that they were not the true teachers, but we were hooked and burdened by all of their Cain civilization, all of their materialism and their various ideologies and their communism and their capitalism and all of these vying against one another. And there at the foot of the Christ and the living Buddha is the devotee who simply desires to be free. Now, therefore, we are tired of the fallen angel's declaration of independence from Almighty God. We are tired of having a separate will from the Lord God Almighty. We are ready to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. When we make that affirmation of being which Jesus made when he descended into the body prepared for him in Bethlehem, so we take the first step on the path of self-determination. Our declaration of independence in and through Almighty God is the true path of individual Christhood. It is upon this path that our nation was founded by true adepts of the sacred fire on the foundation of the Judeo-Christian tradition, embodying all of the vast teachings which our Lord Jesus brought back from the far east where he journeyed in preparation for his mission. Therefore, we come in the tradition of the revolutionaries of the spirit, east and west. They fought for and they won their spiritual independence from the false hierarchies. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It is upon that point that we declare our independence from all other systems, isms, ideologies, compartmentalizations, and separations from one another and from the living God. Remember Gautama Buddha when he sat under the bow tree Remember when he had to declare his independence from all of the forces of darkness. They challenged him and they said, you do not have the right to be doing what you are doing. It's the same old line, isn't it? You don't have a right to be here. You don't have a right to think what you want to think. You may not meditate or pray. You must do what we say. You must follow the run of the mill, the middle class. You must not stray or deviate from our religion, our systems. No revolutionaries, no one who is different. Our children are brought up in our schools. All must be alike. The equality that is preached in effect becomes a leveling. Yes, the equality of the lowest common denominator, that is equality. We see then that those who fought for physical freedoms and human rights also were fighting for spiritual rights and divine rights. Gautama Buddha was determined to find the key to suffering in the world. 
He went into some muddy after. He dealt with the forces that would deny his right to find the solution to the human imprisonment of the soul. And so he touched the earth with the earth-touching mudra and all of nature and elemental life and the angelic hosts affirmed his right to find God in his own way, as it says in the Old Testament, under his own vine and fig tree. This right we cherish, this right we must exercise, because unless we exercise the right to prove our independence under God's will, no one will understand that the right must be kept and cherished and defended as none other. And so we come to be the example, and we look now at the chart of the I Am Presence. The great beauty of this configuration, you see all in one your heaven, your lower self, the divine mediator who is the central figure. If you just visualize those spheres within spheres as great spheres of light, they are the individual heaven world. Vast reaches of cosmic consciousness that are above you surrounding the point of the I am who I am. This is the I am that I am that spoke to Moses, that gave divine direction for the seed of Abraham, delivered the miracles at Moses' hand and Aaron's. The light of the I am is above you. As you see the chart behind me, Visualize that same sphere of light above you. It is God as God's presence, individualized for each one of us. Out of the point of God the Father, there descends the light emanation whom we call Christ. Christos, the anointed one, the Son, and the Son is the great mediator, mediating this powerful light for this this prodigal son who stands as the lower figure. It is child man, shorn of his identity, for he has lost it through the misuse of the exercise of free will and the misuse of the science of the spoken word. And so this Lord dwelt in Jesus. Jesus, our brother, and the great example showed us that the reason for being in embodiment on earth is that the mighty trinity of life should be self-realized in us through the three persons of the trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, self-realized through the threefold flame in the heart. I would like to give you the example in the life of Jesus and his teaching where he did in fact Show the declaration of independence, wholeness for life. Jesus had to affirm his right to be the Son of God. He had to affirm and defend his right to declare that God was his Father. So listen to this teaching, this mighty initiation that is described by Luke in his 13th chapter. There are three separate teachings here, lessons that show how we too must declare our independence if we would be whole. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Jesus knew the tendency of the human heart to consider that those who have adversity or are persecuted must somehow be less in the kingdom of God, be somehow sinners above all to have deserved such conditions. And so he answered this tendency of the mind to di dismiss calamity, to harden our hearts toward those who suffer and to say they must deserve it. He said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, 
ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus was showing the opportunity for choice, for the declaration of independence, to be whole or not to be whole, to embrace life or not to embrace life. So these individuals had personal and planetary karma come upon them, or not necessarily the initiation of darkness unto them could easily have been an initial act without karma. He shows their calamity and he says it will happen to you unless you repent. And so what is repentance? Repentance is going back to putting on the armor of God, the wedding garment, to seal oneself under the shadow of the Almighty and the Lord's angel, Archangel Michael, to fulfill the inner vow, the original vow to be God in manifestation here below as above. This is what we vowed to do. Lo, I am come to do thy will, O God. The second lesson comes following this. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that, Thou shalt cut it down. This then shows the requirement of the fig tree to bear fruit. You are that tree. You are that fig tree. Three years the Lord has come and said, I desire fruit. We must bring fruit to the teacher, to the Christ, to the universal one who has sponsored us, we must show that there is a reason why earth should be displaced for our coming, why earth should take care of us, absorb our refuse, provide for us a path and natural resources for our creativity. And so the Lord comes and says, take it away, cut it down. And who intercedes? The Christ intercedes. Let me help the tree. Let me dig around it. Let me put organic fertilizer around it. Let me help it bear fruit. So comes the Christ with his lost word, his lost teaching, his Holy Spirit, his healing hands. He will wash your feet. He will care for the roots of pride and the roots of the subconscious and the records of karma. He will help you declare your independence under God to bear fruits of the spirit and of your hands. So it is a marvelous teaching that if we try, if we work, if we respond to those hands and bear fruit, we may justify our existence another year and another year and in the meantime we add rings to our tree of life we add the fruit of good works we increase in light and then we can pass the next test in our declaration of independence which jesus does how many of you would pass this test Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. Eighteen years, she was bound by the laws she had set in motion, laws of her own mortality. She had bound them round about herself. This is why we need our Holy Christ self. This is why we need the mediator and the universal Christ. Because when we are all tangled up in the snarl of our human karma 
and beset with our diseases. We need the liberator, but the liberator cannot approach us unless we have opened the channels of our being, unless we have opened our hearts and let him come into our temple, let him steal in in the night and be the fire of our hearts. And from that inner sanctuary of the heart, the fire glows and begins to break down those entanglements and those bonds we have created. And so she could in no wise lift up herself and when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Who here dares to follow the path of Jesus Christ? to increase the light of his temple and his chakras, to fill himself with the Spirit of God and to appeal unto the Lord God, that when the woman bound 18 years comes, you have the wherewithal to transfer the light. The command, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Infirmity is karma. Christ, the light of the world, takes unto himself that burden and returns to her the light lost. And it is transferred by the touch of the hand, the power of Alpha and Omega. He in his wholeness places upon her the wholeness of the currents of the I Am Presence. Jesus had full access to that I Am Presence. You have it also. You need only prove it, demonstrate it, and dare to be the light bearer of your I am. So here comes the test. He performed a mighty work, but it was on the Sabbath. Not only must you have the courage to be the light, but to know that the light itself is not subject unto man-made laws. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. There is an outer tradition of religion in this world, and there is an inner tradition. The outer tradition is passed down from physical person to physical person, but the inner tradition is passed by the Spirit. How else could Jesus Christ have been made a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who came and met Abraham, served him communion, and Abraham tithed to him a tenth of the spoils? Jesus was born thousands of years later, and yet he was a priest in that tradition. Who anointed him? Where did his priesthood derive? Thus we understand there is a spiritual transfer. There is a spiritual light of the Holy Ghost who touches whomsoever he will in any faith or religion, any organization, whether the doctrine is right or wrong, if the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, he will come upon you. And when he comes upon you, he will deliver you of your sense of mortality and your bondage and your darkness and your sense of separation and compartmentalization, and you become a universal spirit with the Lord Christ. This is happening today all over the world. It is a universal age. And the revolutionaries have to come apart and have the strength to challenge those who say, you may not heal on the Sabbath. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, 
be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. They rejoiced because he, the example, stood in their midst and declared their independence from laws of tyrants, man-made laws confining the God flame. You see the rejoicing is that one man raised up the spirit of the I am, the Christ spirit. One man did it and that light put them to shame. What one can do, all can do. That is the motto of the great white brotherhood. All the saints in heaven have shown that. What one has done, anyone can do. That is why we cheer when freedom fighters in any nation gain the victory over any tyranny or darkness, because it proves we have won something also. We have won the day for the Lord. This is that day. This is that day when you can come and wash in the pool of Siloam. You can be healed and cleansed, not by a miracle healing, not merely by belief or faith, but by your exercise of the science of the I Am Presence. You've been watching The Coming Revolution in Higher Consciousness with Elizabeth Clare Prophet. The preceding public access program has been presented through the assistance of Church Universal and Triumphant. Box A, Malibu, California, 90265. If you would like to know more, call this number or write this address. The Coming Revolution in Higher Consciousness. Listen now to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, educator, author, and authority on the most exciting story of our time, The Coming Revolution in Higher Consciousness. Good evening, beloved friends of light. I am so grateful to be with you here in Manila. It is the fulfillment of a dream of a lifetime. The great joy that comes to me in coming here is based on what we have shared for more than 80 years, building freedom in this nation together, loving one another, working side by side, sharing in our education, our dreams, our ideals, fighting together for victory, and winning that victory in World War II. And so we stand in a physical freedom, a spiritual freedom, a freedom of consciousness that now also must be forged in one, the freedom of the mind and the heart and the soul. And when we gain that freedom, we will find that it will be reflected in the transformation of our lives, in the healing of the nations, their governments, their economies, the society, the healing of all breaches, as we find the oneness of heart that is prophesied in the book of Isaiah, the government shall be upon his shoulder. And that his is the universal Christ so exemplified, so manifest by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I come with a great message of the ancient religion which the peoples of the fire ring of the Pacific have shared. This ancient religion comes from the land of Lemuria, called Mu, or the motherland, which sank 
beneath the waves of the Pacific thousands of years ago in a cataclysmic action of fire, earthquake, and an immense record that was left in the subconscious of the earth and of ourselves. There were great golden ages on Lemuria thousands upon thousands of years ago that are recorded yet in tablets that are sealed in caves of the Himalayas. The ancient religions of the Far East came down to us from the motherland. Our souls remember the temple of the Divine Mother. We remember giving invocations to the light of Almighty God and the universal light manifest from time to time in messengers that God would send to us called avatars, those who were the manifestation of God. And so at the sinking of the continent was the loss of the great record of technology and science, the greatest the world has ever known, far exceeding that which we have today. The decline in the civilization of Lemuria and of Atlantis, which was where the Atlantic Ocean now is, led to that cataclysm. And the decline came through the abuses of science, of religion, of the abundant life, and of God government. We have returned to a moment of destiny and decision in this hour. And that moment is to choose to be the instrument of God or to go the way of all flesh and to once again see the degeneration and the decay of civilization through totalitarian movements, through tyrants, through terrorism, and through human solutions to human problems. We need divine solutions to human problems. And these solutions I would like to share with you this evening. They come from our own scriptures of the Old and New Testament and from out of the East. They hark back to the unity of life, the law of the one, the one religion. For after all, universality is the one. Religion comes from the verb to bind to bind man to God. This is what we seek. We seek the divine union here on earth. We seek to fan the sacred fire in our hearts so that we can meet the challenge of injustice that faces us at every hand. Beloved hearts of freedom, I bring to you the consummate message of the prophets of the Old Testament of Jesus Christ and the apostles and the great lights of the East. I bring you a focalization of this message at the point of action, at the point of our needs today, the point of the healing of the soul of all of us, first and foremost, and then our bodies. And with this healing and wholeness, then we reach out and we solve the problems of our nation. With the power of the light of God and his intercession, Without God, the I am that I am, and his mighty archangels, we will not bring justice to this or any land. And with that light and with the science of the spoken word, we will discover together the power that has always been present to change civilization, to raise it up, and to transmute the cause and core of all oppression of the people. This is a science that God has been revealing to me in this life as early as I can remember at the age of two. And my recall of previous lifetimes shows also the growing understanding of that presence of God with us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let us discover who is that I am that I am and how each of us can release that light from our hearts for immediate action in this city and nation to the highest interests of all people. From the base of the pyramid of life to its apex, we find that the blessing of God resolves all human problems. Let us meditate upon the Lord. For David said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. To whom do we look then to fulfill our every need? 
Not the human consciousness, not social programs, not this or that scheme, but we look to that Lord as a reality, not as something far off, but as the ever-present help. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, nor shall any man, woman, or child in the Philippines, for he has promised, and these promises are your inheritance and mine and everyone's. But we must claim our inheritance. We must unite forces with the advocate before the Father, the attorney who pleads our case before the court of the sacred fire. We must call upon the Lord that he might answer because we have free will to invite him or not invite him to intercede in our life. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're speaking about consciousness and the building of the aura with light. We're speaking about the seven centers of being and the light of God flowing through these. We're talking about action here and now. Who then is the Lord to whom David referred? The Lord in the Old Testament is spelled with four letters, all capitalized, L-O-R-D. They are an abbreviation for the Hebrew words which God gave to Moses, the yud He vav He. And so for our deliverance in this hour, from servitude to our own human habits, human consciousness, for we are first slaves of our own mortality and limitation before we become slaves of the false pastors, whether in church or state or in the economy. And therefore listen to the word of God unto Moses. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. The mountain of God is the symbol of your own higher consciousness, your divine reality, which is even now your real self. The form that you wear and your soul and your consciousness is the effect of that higher cause. So we go to the mountain of God, for his holiness is our higher consciousness. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the mists of a bush. Out of the very midst of a bush, an ordinary bush, a sacred fire is burning. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. I love this passage with all my heart because I know that I am the bush, you are the bush. And the great symbology and teaching of our God is this. It is that that which is common may become extraordinary by the descent of the sacred fire of God. God has placed the divine spark within you. It is tiny. It must become fanned with devotion, with meditation, with love for him, and with the touch of Christ and the touch of the Lord's angel. And suddenly the sacred fire fills all the house, and we are born anew as new creatures in Christ. We come to the mountain of God, and we discover who that God is who will talk to us as he spoke to Moses. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. How is it that we who are flesh may have a spiritual energy and a sacred fire burning in our hearts and not be consumed? Is this not the extraordinary miracle of God, that the word is made flesh, that the spiritual light can coexist with matter? Who can unite? spirit and matter, but the living God, Elohim, who created us. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, 
God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. So your divinity, your higher consciousness calls to you by name, by your very first name in this hour, as that same presence called to little Samuel, who finally replied, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And so Moses answered and said, Here am I. He declared his manifestation and the angel said to him, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. In the great initiations of the twelve hierarchies of the sun, the feet are the symbol of understanding. Moses' understanding heretofore was a limited human understanding. Put off your old understanding, for you stand on the holy ground of the very mind of God. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, which is to say the divine presence of each and every one of the patriarchs and each and every child of light. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, which are in the Philippines, which are in America. It is the same I am speaking today, and here is the message of our deliverance. And have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. There is not a sorrow that you bear in this hour, nor a sorrow that is borne by any member of this magnificent nation that is not known directly by God nor solvable by him, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey, to bring them up out of the consciousness they have fallen into, of accepting the binding action of their oppressors. I will raise them in consciousness, I will deliver them, I will show them the way through my presence unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of Israel out of Egypt. This is a real and present power. And Moses was so humble before this power, he said, Who am I? Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? You may say the same of yourself. Who am I to lead the coming revolution in higher consciousness? Who am I to bear the flame of freedom to my nation? Who am I the torchbearer of liberty? And I will say to you, you are the manifestation of God, and God in you is worthy of the calling of keeping the flame of freedom in this very heart of Asia. And he said, certainly I will be with thee, as God promises that to you. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. The place of serving God is the higher consciousness. That point of oneness is the point of the beginning of our victory. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, God said unto Moses his name, I am that I am. Such a powerful statement of God's being with us. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Whenever you see the word Lord written throughout the Bible in capital letters, it means I am that I am. 
but we have forgotten our inheritance. God said to Moses, this is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. This is my memory. This is how you will remember that I am with you and that I am the presence of the I am overshadowing you individually and personally. And this God says to us, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt, that which is done to you in the Philippines or in any nation upon earth. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. The revelation of the sacred fire is the greatest discovery of all time and space. We think that there was an acceleration with the discovery of physical fire or the wheel, but it is the sacred fire, and that very name and that very fire is the lost cord. It is the lost vibration and the lost word of our identification with the power of God that is able to deliver us. I want to talk to you about the chart of your divine self about your I am presence and how through the affirmation of the name of God I am you can draw forth once again the power the wisdom and the love of God to solve all of your problems Isaiah wrote as a message from God to us arise shine for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. The glory of the Lord that is risen upon you is that glorious causal body, the seven rainbow rays of God surrounding the I am presence. In the book of Revelation, the angel of the Lord descends from God to speak to John and he has a rainbow upon his head you are the lower figure in the chart there are three persons here reminding us of the Trinity of life that is always with us so as the lower figure in the chart you see yourself surrounded by the violet flame it is the action of the Holy Spirit it is the sacred fire that consumes sin or what we call karma causes we have set in motion in this life or previous lives that now accumulate and which are accumulating on a world scale as planetary karma. We are at the end of the 2,000 year cycle of Jesus Christ known as the Piscean Age. In this hour, planetary karma increases. The seven angels bring the vials of the seven last plagues. They pour out the karma that has been set aside due to the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, which now must be faced, for we must learn from our experiences and from our sowings. The violet flame, then, is the agency of the Holy Spirit, whereby God keeps his promises when he says, in that day I will remember their sin no more. He says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is the promise of the great alchemy of transmutation, which is delivered by the seventh angel to us. The prophecies come forth out of the book of Revelation, for the book of Revelation is the book, aside from Jesus' prophecies and some of the prophecies of the ancient Old Testament that deals with today. And so the seventh angel, when he begins to sound, the mysteries of God are finished. It is for today. Today we learn the mystery of the meaning of the experiences and the initiations that occur in scripture from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is not so much a book of religion as it is a history of the individual path of initiation. Initiations are tests which our souls are given. We look at Joshua. 
We look at the many who have gone before us. We see their mistakes. We see their failures. We see their victories. And we learn. And suddenly we realize that the Bible is not only the story of our soul, it is the psychology of the soul's victory. And when we come all the way to Revelation, we realize that though we may gain the victory of freedom through the confederacy of the tribes of Israel become the 13 states in America, though we lay the foundation of a constitution and God government in our midst, unless we win our spiritual freedom, we lose everything. And therefore, the demand upon us, this nation and all nations, is to win our spiritual victory, for then no oppressors will be able to take from us our human rights or our divine rights. This is the key to the holding of the land that the Lord our God has given to us. Thus you are a vessel as the lower figure in the chart. You are a vessel of the Holy Spirit. And this violet flame is intended to fill all of your house, purifying and cleansing you. As you fast and pray for spiritual healing, your subtler bodies and your aura are also purified as you affirm the light of the violet flame. Now the great mediator who stands between the I am presence and the lower figure is the figure of Christ. Who is this Christ? It is Christ Jesus and it is the universal Christ. Jesus said of this Christ, this is my body, my universal body of light which is broken for you. We partake of the body of light each time we celebrate Holy Communion. John spoke of this light and he said, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So we are ignited by Christ, by the Christ light. And so this personal figure of Christ is the manifestation of Christ with us as the mediator between ourselves and the Father, the I am presence. Now this Christ has manifested to us in many ways. We've seen glimpses of that Christ in the priest Melchizedek, the priest of Salem, king of Salem and priest after the Most High God. We've seen glimpses of that Christ in the virtue and love of our friends and loved ones. We find the light of Christ as a prism is reflected and refracted through all of us, some portion. We are all intended to be expressions of that real self. We are made in that image. We are the manifestation of that one. And therefore, we have a right to put on the whole mantle of that sonship, for this was the purpose of his coming. Let me read to you what Jeremiah said, for he talked about these last days. He talked about the great coming of this Christ, and there's a very special name that God gave Jeremiah for this person. And this is the great judgment pronounced by God through Jeremiah. He says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Who are these pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep? We find that pastors are leaders in every walk of life that abuse their authority and their office. For every leader in the world, no matter what government he is under, stands before Almighty God to represent his people and to deal justly with them and to use the law as the divine standard, the law of God and the just laws ratified in man. These are not merely spiritual leaders, they are leaders in every walk of life, in the government, in the economies of the nations, in education, in society, and in our own household. In fact, every one of us is a leader. We are responsible to people that we must care for, and we respond to those who lead us. And therefore, those who have the responsibility of leadership, it is prophesied by God. When you hear the word woe in the Bible, it means, let their karma be upon them for the deeds which are then pronounced. So you see, the law of God is self-fulfilling. 
You can in love with great intensity the true self and the real self of everyone. You can minister to life. When you invoke the justice of Almighty God, then what occurs is that the injustice of the false pastors comes to their doorstep for redemption, and they must choose whom they will serve, their self-idolatry or the Lord God in the people. This is Holy Scripture. It is true today, and it is happening today. But you see the great body of believers upon earth, all of us in the Philippines today must ratify the prophecies. The prophecies must be affirmed and confirmed and believed in and trusted. And thus, we must no longer be sheep, but rise to the calling of also being shepherds. So what does God say he will do in the face of the leaders whom he is scattering? And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them both their physical food and their spiritual food. And they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord, the mighty I am presence which is over you each one right now. And hear this great prophecy. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. This is the hour of the coming of this king. And what is his name? In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. Judah and Israel are the twelve tribes. So who are they today? They are the reincarnated children of God who were scattered across the whole face of the earth, who have embodied in every nation, who are the seed of light. They shall dwell safely, and this is the name whereby this king shall be called. The Lord, our righteousness. You see, he is not a person. He is the person, the Lord, the I am presence sends forth the king. What is the king? He is the key, the K, to the incarnation, I am, of God in you. The king, or the ruler of the people, is intended to embody this Christ and be the key for this Christ to flow as the abundant life and equity in the land. This is the responsibility of the highest ruler, and it is the responsibility of all of us together to affirm and confirm that holy office and to see to it that it is fulfilled. The Lord, our righteousness, is the middle figure in the chart. The Lord has sent forth the manifestation of himself as the Son, as your personal deliverer. And that Son is called today the Lord, our righteousness, because by the voice of God in us, who is the voice of this Lord, we understand right and wrong. We know when we are involved in incorrect action that is not fulfilling the law of our I am presence, we feel the vibration of it. We may fool ourselves into believing that we are hiding from that Lord or that we are not seen, but it is not so. Every jot and tittle must be satisfied. So the salvation of the nation begins with the individual, and that is the great tradition of the ancient prophets of Israel that is consummated in the life of Jesus Christ, for he is the supreme individualization of that universal word. And his example is the path we must emulate, not remaining forever as sinners, but becoming one with that Christ and putting on our divine inheritance. Sin has no power to destroy us except we continue to engage in it. As soon as we stop it and embrace God and his laws, we find that we know what our reality is. The Lord, our righteousness. The revelation of this holy Christ self is the real meaning of the second coming of Christ. You see him descending in this chart in clouds, clouds of glory. Every eye shall see him. He is known of all. It is quite a puzzlement to understand how Jesus could appear one place on earth and everyone on the whole world would see him. 
But the seeing of this Christ is the seeing of Christ descending into your temple, feeling the quickening in your heart and the great spirit of this Lord. The great mystic John the Beloved wrote the promise of Jesus. He said that Jesus said, those who obey God and love him, both the Father and the Son will come and dwell with him and take up their abode with him. In other words, the chart and the revelations of the Old and New Testament show us that God the Father as the I Am Presence and the Supreme Lawgiver of our life, God the Son as the Presence of the Christ or the Lord our Righteousness are personally with us always. When God created your soul and sent you forth from his heart, he gave you the gift of himself, the replica, the manifestation of his presence and of his eternal son, so that through that promise, that oneness, that feeling of God with you, you might find your way back home. Could any of us find our way to God unless God be with us? Could any of us hope to fulfill the mandate, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect? That is Jesus' command. I used to be troubled as a child. How can I approach perfection? Nothing is perfect in the flesh. But God is speaking of the perfecting of men's hearts, of the mind and the soul and the spirit, of the balancing of karma, of the washing of our garments with a violet flame, and ascending back to him as Jesus did. Everything that Jesus did, he did for our example. He knew the books would be tampered with. He knew they would take from us the fullness of the message. So he must leave a record written in the sands of the earth. God said to the prophet, in that day I will make a new covenant with them. I will write my law in their inward parts. I will place it within their hearts and they will all know me from the least of them unto the greatest. And no one will have to tell anyone else who is God. They will all know me. They will know more, say every man his neighbor, know the Lord. We won't have to convert each other because as Moses we see this I am presence face to face. Who is censoring the books? Who censors the press? Who takes from us those things we have a right to know? I think we should go back to the beginning so that we can solve present problems. This is a book I've recently authored. It's called The Lost Years of Jesus. I researched it through manuscripts written by Buddhist historians in the first century, locked in a monastery at Himis in Ladakh in northern India. These manuscripts have been seen by a number of people for the last century. From 1887 to 1939, they were seen by many. About eight of these individuals' stories are written in this book. Those who were able to earn the confidence of the High Lama of this monastery were shown documents, books, presented with these books with the words, these books say your Jesus was here. And so they tarried and they were translated. They wrote them down, they published them. And this is what this book contains, the point by point research and the documents. No conclusions drawn. You examine the evidence, you draw your own conclusions. I would like to read you a few words. Interestingly enough, not one of these except those who came later, was an American, or a Filipino for that matter. Two of them were Russian, one of them was a Hindu, and one was Swiss. The second Russian, Nicholas Rorick, went, and he was a great artist in his time. He was there in 1929. He made a five-year exploration, scientific exploration of the territory he took with, his, with him his son, George Rorick, who was an expert in the Mongolian dialects and all of the dialects spoken by these peoples. Very important to gain their confidence because these lamas see Westerners as, as those who come to steal their holy relics and thus also to understand the language concerning our Lord. 
So Nicholas Rorick writes in his diary, and by the way, he did many paintings portraying the East and did magnificent paintings which are in this book illustrating Christ in the East. So he says, regarding the manuscripts of Christ, first there was a complete denial. Of course, denial first comes from the circle of missionaries. Then slowly, little by little, are creeping, fragmentary, reticent details difficult to obtain. Finally, it appears that about the manuscripts the old people in Ladakh have heard and know. And such documents as manuscripts about Christ and the Book of Shambhala lie in the darkest place. And the figure of the Lama, the compiler of the book, stands like an idol in some sort of fantastic headgear. And how many other relics have perished in dusty corners? For the tantric lamas have no interest in them. This monastery at Himas was the crossroads of monasteries to the east and west of it, particularly protected, and therefore other monasteries, when they feared the coming of conquerors, brought their treasures to Himis. And so there are many treasures there. Rorik continues, in Ley, we again encountered the legend of Christ's visit to these parts. The Hindu postmaster of Ley and several Ladakhi Buddhists told us that in Ley, not far from the bazaar, there still exists a pond near which stood an old tree. Under this tree, Christ preached to the people before his departure to Palestine. We also heard another legend of how Christ, when young, arrived in India with a merchant's caravan and how he continued to study the higher wisdom in the Himalayas. We heard several versions of this legend which has spread widely throughout Ladakh, Xinjiang, and Mongolia, but all versions agree on one point, that during the time of his absence, Christ was in India and Asia. The question we have to ask is why? Why would he spend 17 years, the lost years, all of these in Asia, in India? We ask the question, was he pursuing the lost wisdom of the continent of Lemuria. It is recorded that Christ preached regarding the mother and the mother of the world. Our scriptures do not tell us this, and yet, gratefully, we give the Hail Mary. Why did he go to the East to prepare himself for his mission in Palestine? A good and sensitive Hindu spoke meaningfully about the manuscript of the life of Isa. Isa is the name they called him, Saint Isa, their translation of Jesus. Why does one always place Isa in Egypt during the time of his absence from Palestine? His young years, of course, were passed in study. The traces of his learning have naturally impressed themselves upon his later sermons. To what sources do these sermons lead? What is there in them of Egyptian? And why does one not see traces of Buddhism, of Hinduism, of India? It is difficult to understand why the wandering of Isa by caravan path into India and into the region now occupied by Tibet should be so vehemently denied. Let us remember that the greatest disciple of Jesus Christ, John the Beloved, who wrote the Gospel, the Epistles, and wrote down the Book of Revelation, learned the mysteries of God when he placed his head on the bosom of Christ. He leaves to us a great key. The opening words of his gospel are the following. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and without the Word was not anything made that was made. By you and by that Word you were framed and the worlds were framed. Why is that such a key? because it happens to be almost a direct quote from the Hindu scriptures, more ancient than Hinduism, without known origin, the Vedas. This is a sentence right out of the Vedas. Why do we not know the origin of the Vedas? Because it goes back to the mists of the motherland and Lemuria, the most ancient scriptures on the face of the earth. Now, where did John receive those words, and would he write them without his Lord's approval? Such a devotee of love. Well, there were Hindu or Buddhist missionaries in Palestine in those days. Would he listen to them when he had found his master? 
opening the book concerning the manifestation of that word in Christ Jesus, equating the coming of Christ with the ancient coming of the avatar. Of course, his teacher, his master, his rabbi gave to him the mystery and the understanding that he brought from the East. At least, this is my conclusion. Let me read to you some of the scriptures guarded in Ladakh today. These are written as scriptures with verses. In the course of his 14th year, the young Isa, blessed of God, came on this side of Sindh and established himself among the Aryas in the land beloved of God. Fame spread the reputation of this marvelous child throughout the length of northern Sindh. And when he crossed the country of the Five Rivers and the Rajputana, the devotees of the god Jain prayed him to dwell among them. But he left the erring worshippers of Jain and went to Juggernaut, in the country of Orissa where repose the mortal remains of Vyasa Krishna, and where the white priests of Brahma made him a joyous welcome. How did they know him? They knew him by the sign of his coming. His own aura, his own consciousness preceded him. They had never seen him before, but they loved him and welcomed him, and they taught him. Here he is, a boy of 14, a teenager, going forth to learn the mysteries of all the world religions because he is the epitome. He is the one who is to present the totality and fullness of the one everyone is expecting, everyone is looking to, but he must come clothed in their garment. Every civilization sees Christ in their own garment, so he comes to fulfill the law and the traditions of our culture. So there is a statue of the infant of Prague in the presidential mansion, but he is wearing the dress and the visage of a Filipino child, as it should be. We all must know him as we are, and then when we see him, we know we will be like him, because we will see him face to face, as John wrote. Thus Jesus sought and studied not only the religions of the East and the word of the prophets, but the religion of Persia, of the Zarathustras. And he singled out the light and embodied it all, the seven rainbow rays of the seven major world religions, but he did more than that. Let me read on. They taught him to read and understand the Vedas, to cure by aid of prayer, to teach, to explain the holy scriptures to the people, and to drive out evil spirits from the bodies of men, restoring unto them their sanity. Why is it so precious to know this? Because we come so closer, so much closer to the boy Jesus. Teenagers all over the world are looking for a purpose and a mission in life, and they fall into the traps of drugs and the misuse of the light of their chakras, squandering that light or being forced to in so many deleterious ways. But this is how we spend our teenage years as Jesus did, finding the threads of the lost word, finding our destiny awakening and quickening the inner memory of many lifetimes that go back and back and back until finally we remember. We remember Lemuria, and it is easy to rem remember Lemuria in the Philippines because you have the palm trees, you have the signs even of the fruits of Lemuria. And so the soul memory begins to awaken and all these outer things we are indifferent to because we must build the inner building of the temple of man. It is the mighty work of the ages. We are all builders of our souls and our spirits because we have free will. Jesus then made himself a student so that we would know we would have to study also and search and find Horeb, the higher consciousness, the I am presence, the Lord our righteousness, and the true temple which is our spiritual body. All of this is our quest it's the most important discovery in our life. And when we have it, we can do all other things. We can fulfill our professions, our education, our families. We can be breadwinners, examples, and good shepherds to our children and to our people. For all things proceed from the one light. He passed six years at Juggernaut, at Rajagriha, at Benares, and in the other holy cities. Everyone loved him 
for Isa lived in peace with the Vaisyas and the Sudras, whom he instructed in the Holy Scriptures. The lowest of classes, defrauded of their spiritual and physical inheritance by the leaders who amassed power and oppressed them, taking from them the sacred word of the Scriptures and also what was meet for them economically. But the Brahmins, the priests, and the Kshatriyas, the warrior class, told him that they were forbidden by the great power of Brahma to come near to those whom he had created from his side and his feet. Here is an oppression going on 2,000 years ago, and it would have continued had a savior not arisen. But the savior is not flesh and blood. This is our idolatrous consciousness that perceives that this one or that one is going to save us. No, it is the Lord, our righteousness, the inner Christ of us all, the God within. That is the savior of the nation, beginning always with the individual. Who can fight the one times one times one of the universal God? Who can stand against a people united instead of divided in all sorts of human solutions to political and economic problems? It is a very conspiracy against the unity of God that we should go this way and that way and saying, this will solve our problems, that will solve our problems, this person will deliver us. When it is the light, the single light, that is the strength. And so what is the age-old conspiracy that goes back tens of thousands of years against the soul of all of us? Divide and conquer. A people divided, a house divided cannot stand. But a house that is in the union of God cannot be oppressed and will not be left to the devices of the interlopers. And so that the Vaisyas were only authorized to hear the reading of the Vedas and this on festival days only. They had taken from them the ancient scriptures and why is this? Why is the name of God taken from us? Because it is power. And so the amassing of power and money is the means of control in every age. Yet the power and the money, the wealth of a nation, belong to the people. But the source of it is that I am presence and that causal body. And we are going to take up the affirmations of the word now to show you how these blessings and this power will come tumbling down when you obey God's laws and practice the science of the spoken word. Jesus took his stand for the common people. He preached against the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas. They plotted his death. They were going to take him and kill him. But the people warned him and he escaped by night. He preached to them and his preaching is recorded not to go after many gods. We think of gods as statues in stone, but our gods are those whom we fear and hate the most. We have to stop hating and fearing anyone or any person outside of ourselves because God in us is in us. And that is our idolatry, that is our division, and that is why we lose the reins of our nation. Idolatry is always of the self, beginning with the ego. Do we exalt in pride and ambition our own ego the way those who misrepresent us do? If we are at fault in our own temple, we will not be given the power of Almighty God to challenge the oppressors. The winning of the fight for freedom worldwide begins with the raising up of God within you, as Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He used the name of God, I am, and gave an affirmation following it. And he brought that mantra back from India. And you can say it. I am, God in me is the resurrection and the life of my true identity, my true person in God. I am that I am, where I stand is holy ground. God is in me, that I am presence dwells in my heart. I am one with every other child of God universally and on this planet. And in the oneness of that flame of freedom, the power of God is come for the complete transmutation of civilization based on the worship of materialism and the god of lust and the desecration of our children. Hear what Jesus said to Pilate. The record goes about when he returned to Jerusalem and his trial. It speaks of the teaching of Jesus and that teaching is quoted beautifully. 
And then it goes on to say, the ruler Pilate, frightened by the devotion of the people to Isa, who, if his enemies may be believed, wanted to cause the uprising of the people, ordered one of his spies to make accusation against him. You know why Jesus let all of this happen, all of the encounter and the crucifixion? We focus on the crucifixion as something necessary to our salvation. But in fact, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ interacted with the worst of the fallen ones, embodied fallen angels, the power elite, those who set themselves up in church and state to see to it that no one who would, would return to the people the lost word. Why did they do it? It was a message to you and me that if we would be followers of him, we must go through the same initiation or testing. The test is this. Can you stand up against the tyranny of your own synthetic self or carnal mind? When you slay that, then you can stand up against the embodiment of that darkness in those who have set themselves against the light of the people. The test and the initiation in John the Baptist and Jesus, one beheaded, one crucified, was a message that could not be erased. If you follow me all the way home in the resurrection, you will have to face this test, not only as an individual, but as a nation. That is the test we face together on this planet, and it is in the book of Revelation. And so Esau, who taught only of the salvation of his fellow men, endured all sufferings, said Esau to Pilate, not far hence is the time when by the highest will the people will become purified. You see, he is teaching that our soul purification and our physical purification is necessary to our victory. Because then shall come the proclamation of the deliverance of the peoples and their union into one family. Then turning to Pilate, this was Jesus' message. Why to demean thy dignity and teach thy subordinates to live in deceit? Why raise up a spy to lie against me, when even without this thou couldst have also had the means of accusing an innocent one? You, Pilate, have all power. Why do you teach the people to lie? At least one of the people who went to Ladakh and found these manuscripts, Notovich said that in the Vatican, there are many, many documents that tell the whole story. And he asked the question, if they are there, why have we not heard this message? I asked the question also, I do not know. I do not know if those documents are in the Vatican. But I do know that Thomas was the disciple that went to India to preach the gospel. And therefore, I believe that it was known to early Christendom that Jesus also went to India before him. I cherish this because it shows Jesus in action as a spiritual revolutionary. And remember, spiritual is the word. Human revolutions fail. They cause bloodshed. And they engage us in killing one another and destroying our economies so that once again, a small class of tyrants may rule over us. But spiritual revolutions never fail. You can never kill an idea. This is why it is illogical to kill people. Ideas have substance. And until we conquer evil in the mind and the soul and the spirit, it simply is transferred to the next tool of that sinister force. But the spiritual revolution, when God and you are one in your temple, gives you the victory on earth and in heaven. You've been watching The Coming Revolution in Higher Consciousness with Elizabeth Clare Prophet. The preceding public access program has been presented through the assistance of Church Universal and Triumphant, Box A, Malibu, California, 90265. If you would like to know more, call this number or...
is the coming revolution in higher consciousness. Listen now to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, educator, author, and authority on the most exciting story of our time, the coming revolution in higher consciousness. The teachings of the Ascended Masters of the Great White Brotherhood go back not only to India, but far beyond. They go to the ancient continent of Lemuria and to the golden ages which preceded the decline prior to the sinking of that continent beneath the Pacific, as well as the sinking of the continent of Atlantis. Lemuria was the motherland and the central altar of the entire continent was the altar to the mother flame, seen as the base of the pyramid of man, the base of civilization, the white fire that rises on the spine from the base to the crown, that illumines each of the planes of consciousness within us, which are the seven chakras, and that illumines and inspires the creativity of God's sons and daughters, that they might become co-creators with Elohim as above, so below, in matter as in spirit. The mother flame then is the source of the raising of the resurrection fire, and as it rises, so the light of the I Am Presence descends, the light of the Father in heaven. And so when the twain meet in the heart, there is the bursting of that divine wholeness which we call the Christ, the universal light, the personification of God, as the living word. This is the goal of our path, the goal of our union, the goal of our love and our service. And so we came here to do what must be done to save a planet, to call its evolutions back to the worship of the one God, that they might be delivered of the great burdens that are oppressing the peoples of the world today. As this is our last evening in Australia, and it has been such a beautiful and wonderful experience to be with the light bearers of the continent who have come to our meetings. I would like to speak to you about that which is most on our minds, and that is what is coming upon the earth. What are the prophecies of today? What is the prophecy of Jesus Christ as it is written? What is the interpretation of that prophecy as it is given by the seventh angel, Saint Germain? As I meditated upon God in preparation for this service, I opened to the book of Mark, the 13th chapter, which is this very discussion of Jesus with the disciples. And so I understood that the meaning and the facing of the future together is that which is our greatest challenge and sometimes our greatest fear, although it is a subconscious fear. It is out of concern for our transition into the age of Aquarius and the finishing of the cycles of Pisces that we are gathered. We are gathered because we feel the winds of the new age and yet we find ourselves burdened by the conditions of the past, outplaying themselves in an international configuration that truly is a travail upon all of us. And so this is Jesus' prophecy of our tribulation in this hour. And I would like to give you St. Germain's message as to how to face that tribulation together and as one in the light of freedom. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. This is speaking of the temple of the building of the religion of the age. It also is speaking of the temple of man. It shows that Jesus is saying, Ere Christ come unto you, and ere you become one with that universal light, all that you have builded in vain must come down. When God commissioned his prophets, he said, tear down and destroy and destruct and then begin to build again. 
We understand that the facing of our karma causes and effects we have set in motion, not for a thousand or ten thousand years, five hundred thousand years of evolution on this planet for which we have no recorded history except the records of Akasha. It is no wonder that we are burdened by our diseases and by our psychological problems because at the conscious level we are not able to understand what is moving beneath the surface on a personal and a planetary level. So Jesus is giving us the sign. And of course the angel, the seventh angel, comes at the end of the age and he tells us the way to tear down is to call forth the violet flame, which is the agency of the Holy Spirit. That violet light does cleanse and purge and purify. It is the action of the sacred fire. And what does it do? It dissolves everything that is not of the pure perfection of the Christ light. It leaves with us the inner blueprint, all that is real about us, and it dissolves and consumes and replaces the unreal with the real. We have not to fear in the Holy Spirit with us today. The only thing we have to fear is that we do not contact that Holy Spirit and apply the laws of God for our deliverance. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? When shall these causes that have been set in motion come due? When will the ripened fruit fall from the tree? We understand it is at the end of the 2,000 year period of this avatar, this manifestation of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And what is the deceiver? The deceiver is the one who tells you that Christ the Lord is somewhere other than present with you as God's kingdom, his consciousness within you. It is not only in religion, but in the economy, in politics, in all kinds of outer human conditions that we are called, go here, go there. This, pra this reform, this socialism, or this capitalism, or this system will save you. This will preserve you. This will safeguard you all the days of your life. This social security system will see that you have everything you need from the cradle to the grave. You see, it is looking for salvation outside of the eternal light within us. And it is not only in religion, but it is everywhere around us. We are made dependents of the state or the economy or one another emotionally. And we allow it to happen to ourselves because we have lost the word, the great word of the I am that I am. The inner self is the only source. And in that inner self is the Lord, the I am presence, is the Lord Christ is the oneness of life. So the path that the ancients taught of individual self-mastery from ancient Lemuria is the inner walk with God, the mastery by the power of this inner light of fire, air, water, and earth, the four cosmic forces. This is the path to healing. This is the path to release the sacred fire through the chakras. And so this is the great danger that we will follow this system or that philosophy or this conditioning and forget that the name I am that I am is written in our hearts as it was told to Moses. This is my name forever and my memorial to all generations. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be but the end shall not be yet. Well, we have been plagued with wars for centuries. It's difficult to know when this passage is finally fulfilled that these things that needs be have passed. And so we look and we are not without war today, not without bullies subjugating the helpless and the weak, whether on the playground of life whether in Afghanistan, whether in Central America, wherever it is, we see that there is the taking advantage by power or superpower over those who have not the means to defend themselves. And what are they seeking? They seek control. 
They seek population control, land control, but why? Why do they seek that to the extent to line us up brother against brother, causing division that would make us to kill the very ones whom we love? For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. I would say that we are in the beginnings of sorrows as we see these things outplay before us. But take heed to yourselves. For they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them, for a testimony against them. Do you understand the meaning of it? When there is the unjust treatment of the children of God upon earth, it is the testimony before the courts of heaven as to the treachery and intrigue of those who are the persecutors of God's people in every age. Thus Jesus came and subjected himself for a testimony against them that they might outplay their free will and their inner momentums and therefore be seen. You know, the tares and the wheat, the parable of Jesus. It is said that the tares cannot be identified as separate from the wheat until both are grown. So similar to the wheat are the tares. And so Jesus goes on in this parable to interpret that the tares are the seed of the wicked one that were planted in the night among the good seed. And the good seed were the children of Christ and the tares, the seed of the fallen angels. And so he promised that in the end there would come a harvest and the angels who are the reapers would take the tares away. Now this has many applications, this teaching. For one thing we know there has been genetic engineering and experimentation upon humanity since time began in the laboratories of Atlantis and again today coming to the fore. So you can see the tares sown among the wheat as genes sown among the wheat of the Christ consciousness. You can see that there is, as we become more and more aware, a certain limitation in the mind itself or the brain as to the perception of God and the God consciousness. We purify, we cleanse, we worship, we pray, we meditate, we do exercises, and we feel that there is a barrier. Saint Germain said to me, there is a barrier. And he said, I will not tell you all that has been, but simply look at genetic engineering and consider what has happened over the last half million years in evolution. And the sudden spurts of development in mankind that are not explained by evolution. Now what we really have here is a limitation designed upon the people of God upon earth to prevent them from entering in to that reunion with God, that union with Christ, walking and talking with the ascended masters and the angels, which was very common and every day as far as the ancient scriptures are concerned. So Saint Germain said to me, God will not be defeated. God has provided the teaching of the I am presence and the Christ self so that the meditation upon the heart will produce in you the mind of Christ and a universal awareness and you act actually skip and bypass the limited brain and enter directly into the heart of God through the heart of Christ and through this divine spark of the threefold flame in your heart. This is why we pursue the path of the sacred heart of Jesus because we understand that to amplify the flame, the mighty threefold flame of life, is to amplify God's consciousness. Now most people, if you were asked, where is the seat of consciousness, might say the brain. But really, the seat of consciousness is in the threefold flame centered in the heart chakra, which is the most powerful chakra of all. So I am communicating to you by the open door of your hearts, if by free will you open them to me. And by that direct contact with your heart, I may reach your soul, and the intelling or the intelligence of the soul spans 
light years beyond what this poor evolved brain can contain. I remember I was talking to a very famous mathematician and scientist in the United States some years ago, and he had quite popular acclaim. And I was having breakfast with him, and he looked at me very pleased with himself, and he said, I found out God by my intellect. And I looked at him and I said, oh, no, you didn't. There's no way you can perceive God, the infinite mind, with a limited intellect. It is impossible. And he was quite taken aback because he had many theories and propositions to build upon this one statement. I have discovered God by my intellect. Well, I know that my intellect cannot contain God, but I know that God's love in my heart can contain God because that love is a sacred fire, and the sacred fire is God, and only God can contain God, and only God can know God. And the affirmation of his being where I am is the key to the discovery of who that God is. So we come to the end times and the prophecy, and we realize that we are dealing with conspiracies that are older than we are and older than the hills, and records of these. The sinking of the continents of Atlantis and Lemuria did not come about solely by natural cataclysm, but by the misuse of forces by individuals who took this sacred science which we begin to understand in its rudiments today and they took that science and they abused that science and they misused the rhythm of life the rhythm of god's heartbeat they misused science they created creatures too horrible to even to, to describe and they did play with genetics to a far greater extent than most of us realize what is most important is to realize that when the real power of God is discovered and harnessed for evil, continents and civilizations can go down and have gone down. And this is the history and the record of the planet, and we must not fear, because fear is our greatest enemy. And as I have mentioned before in my services, when people come forward and ask for healing, they say to me, please heal me of my fear. And I say, what fear? And they say, I don't know. And so I looked and I called to St. Germain and he, he showed to me the record, the Akashic record of what has happened upon this continent of Australia, which was a part of the continent of Lemuria. And the cataclysm that ensued and the manipulation of forces by fallen angels with evil designs has left a record of such terror such burden upon this continent as to produce a desire not to be awakened among the people, to rather be content with life the way it is, to pursue the diversions of sports and other paths of individual fulfillment, and not to be fully awakened either to the I am presence or to the darkness that lies beneath our feet as a record. Now these records are consumed and transmuted by the violet flame. And this is why we see St. Germain as the keystone in the arch of the Aquarian age, because this dawning age demands that the records of darkness upon earth and the infamy be transmuted, and that those fallen ones yet evolving with us who have been the instigators of wars and manipulations and oppressions and tortures in every century receive then the full momentum of their own karma, which is due. All of this happens by free will. The missing link in theology today is the nature of free will and the fact that because we were given free will, because we exercise it, we can choose to glorify God or we can choose to condemn his offspring. We can move with the great forces of light in the central sun or we can move against them. You have to realize what God did when he created us and gave us free will. He gave us the freedom to move against him. Mark used to say that free will is the necessary fly in the ointment. It's the necessary ingredient to life. And in the grand experiment of freedom, we see portrayed before us on planet Earth today the results of choices made 
for good or for ill, for constructive or destructive purposes. And we must realize that those who make those decisions and make those choices are supremely accountable. And we who have a free and representative government, which we share by our common origins out of Britain, we then are accountable for the decisions that our leaders make. When we have leaders in office and they do not represent the best interests of the Christ in us and in our civilization, then if we do nothing, if we say, well, I'm all right, Jack, I'm going to go do my thing, and politics has nothing to do with me because I'm on a spiritual path, well, you see, we're making karma by allowing our leaders to represent us as we do not want to be represented. And so we must become active as spiritual beings to call forth the violet flame for the transmutation by the sacred fire of that consciousness which perpetuates suppression or limitation or whatever configuration you wish to name in the geopolitical framework of the planet. So we understand then that we are accountable. We are part of the evolution of Earth. We are involved in it. And this is a day and an hour when the sacred fire descends for transmutation on a planetary scale and in the subconscious of our being for our healing and for the healing of the nations. The chart of the presence shows your I am presence, your Christ self, and yourself. And I would like to tell you that it is the archetypal pattern of the tree of life. And it says in the book of Revelation, the leaves of the tree shall be for the healing of the nations. That means the leaves of your tree of life. After the testimony of the injustice that comes in this time, Jesus says, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. The gospel is the good news of your I am presence. This is a chart of your real self. You have all seen it at inner levels. You have seen God face to face in your higher consciousness. It is a drawing that approaches what is real. What is real about you is the I am presence surrounded with these spheres of light. Ring upon ring of the causal body is a manifestation of the causes of first cause set in motion by God for you and of what you have contributed to that by your good works and your good words upon earth. Everything that vibrates as love, as light, rises and expands that great sphere of light. That is your highest consciousness. The middle figure is the mediator, your higher self, or your Christ self. The lower figure is you, standing in the violet flame. You are the temple of the living God. You are intended to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And as you come into alignment with the vibration of that Holy Spirit, love the Son, obey the word of the Father. Jesus promised, as written in the book of John, that my Father and I will come and dwell with you. We will make our habitation with you. It is the promise that things equal to the same thing are equal to each other when the vibration in our hearts and our chakras and our lives is the equivalency of that Son of God, then there is no separation. That Son of God is where I am, God is where I am. But so long as we dwell in the lie of unreality and maya and illusion, then God is, so to speak, in, in distance in time and space, far from us. And so you see that this I am presence is depicted above us because our path of discipleship must take us through lifetimes to the ultimate internalization of the word, the I am that I am of the presence, and the internalization of the light of Christ. Our absence of oneness and internalization of this light today is the reason we come for healing, is the reason we have diseases, degeneration, even accidents. Because God with us is a consuming fire, as Moses observed, and consumes the causes and effects of our karma. So when we have what has been called the grace of God, which is the light of God with us, we begin to emanate such light that there cannot anything come into us, such as viruses, such as the burdens of death that are upon a planetary body. 
So the key to your healing is the expansion of the light of the heart. And the key to that expansion is the science of the spoken word. Because Elohim, who created us in the beginning, gave us the power of speech. And the power of the word is the throat chakra. And the power of the word in the recitation of the mantra, the dynamic decree, is the affirmation of God where you are. Your goal in life is actually to become congruent with God that your humanity is graced and washed with his divinity, that the divinity of God becomes a chalice for the evolution of your humanity. And that is the great demonstration of Jesus Christ. And why am I here? Jesus said it. He said, I came not to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. I did not come to set aside Christianity with a new religion. This is the most ancient religion of all upon which all world religions have been founded. These are the missing links of Christ's teaching which he gave to the disciples in the upper room. This is the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. This is the teaching that tells us that Jesus went to India from the age of 14 to 29. This is the understanding that he tapped not only the ancients of that land, but knew well the story of the motherland. He preached on the world mother and the mother flame and the coming of woman as the raising up of this sacred fire, as the raising up of the soul that is the feminine potential of both man and woman. The gospel must first be published among all nations. This is the very heart of that gospel and of the everlasting gospel of St. Germain, which is promised in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation, where it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to the men of earth. That everlasting gospel is a prophecy for the present. It means that Jesus Christ, who gave this revelation to John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos, was promising future revelation. Some would tell us, the book is closed. Nothing left is to be revealed after the four Gospels. But Jesus himself spoke to John, told him to write it down. We have the little book. And that book itself contains the promise of the little book that is sweet in the mouth and bitter in the belly. It is bitter because we must awaken, as it is shown in the book of Daniel. We must awake to the fact that we are accountable for what is happening on the whole earth. This is our planet. We are the sons and daughters of God. We are the keepers of the flame of life. We have more to do than eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That is the philosophy of those who have no life in them. But the light bearers of the earth have plenty to do to wake up and look around and recognize that we are dealing with planetary karma and we need to get busy because the only thing that is going to stand between that karma and ourselves is the sacred fire of the Holy Spirit, the all-consuming fire. It is like an avalanche. That karma comes through the seven last plagues delivered by the seven mighty archangels. It comes through the four horsemen. They are delivering karma. Why would God let evil come upon earth? He wouldn't let it come upon earth. He would give us free will. We create in error and we must reap because the deal, the covenant, the agreement when we got free will was you can have free will, but you must face the consequences of your actions, your non-actions, your inactions, and your reactions. All of those are causes which either you allowed, turned your back on, or were directly involved in. That's why it's bitter in the belly. Who wants to have to think about being accountable for a whole planet? It's much easier to say, Jesus Christ died for my sins, I'm saved, and forget all the rest. That's the beginning of the path, but it's not the end. We have a work to do, and he taught us how to do it. So he says to us, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, Neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. This is a most marvelous teaching. It's for you and for me. When we dedicate our lives to God, the Holy Spirit comes into our temple and speaks through us. And the spoken word of the Holy Spirit 
becomes the challenge to error or evil. It becomes the judgment as a fire itself. It becomes instruction and teaching and illumination and comfort and healing. You are God's instrument. You are God's representative in Melbourne or anywhere you come from. You're God's representative on planet Earth. Being his instrument gives us a reason for being. And then when we study this great life and the teachings of the Ascended Masters, we understand how we can do that job better than we've ever known before how to do it. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. What is the end? Is it the end of the age, or is it the end of our personal karma, or the end of planetary karma, or the end of the cycle? What is the end? We surely do not believe the world is coming to an end unless we allow some madman to pull the trigger on a nuclear holocaust, which we're not about to do. So what is the end? It's a fulfillment. And what is this division among the household? Why did Jesus say in the Bible, I came not to send peace on earth, but a sword? What is the sword? The sword comes out of the mouth of the faithful and true in the book of Revelation. It's the sword that cleaves asunder the real from the unreal. We must have a separation in our members. We must know what is unreal. We must know what is the error of our consciousness. We are tired of situation ethics. We are tired of a relative good and evil that slides. We need to know. We need to separate out our healthy parts from our sick parts, psychologically and physically. We want what is unreal to go before us to the judgment. The apostle said, some men's sins go before them to the judgment, some men's afterward. How does that interpret according to the Holy Spirit? It means we can invoke the Holy Ghost and the sacred fire and the violet flame today, and we can say, O oh God, cast my sins and my karma into the violet flame. Let them be consumed. And if we go and sin no more and correct our lives and are diligent, that Holy Spirit will wipe out that sin, will transmute the karma, and so it will be noted in the Book of Life. And so when you conclude this embodiment, that will not be a burden on your record that you will have to settle. These things are real. Heaven is a very organized place. You know, I always wondered why they had the symbology of heaven with angels playing on harps. And then when I started to realize the burden of opposition to the publishing abroad of this message, how many people feel threatened by this very simple message I am bringing you, I realized that when one would get to heaven, one would find it a great surcease from the struggle to play one's harp for a while. <laughs> so I could see the point, but seriously speaking, heaven is a place of our sons and daughters of God, elder brothers and sisters on the path, those who have gone before us, they have graduated from Earth's schoolroom. And this is a schoolroom, and if you don't pass, you come back. Now we're all here, right? So none of us passed, right? <laughs> but this time we want to get over the hill. We want to get back to God because we've got other things to do. We've got other universes and worlds to conquer. We've been re-embodying long enough and most of us have been repeating the same old things over and over, and we're all tired of it. So when we say, I want to go home to God, that sets in motion a tremendous cosmic computer of the mind of Christ, and we are put in contact with our inner teacher and outer way showers who can point the way and help us back home. Now, why is St. Germain so important to you? You may have wonderful teachers and counselors. You may have great and inspired teachers that come from the East or the West. But the ingredient of the Ascended Master Saint Germain is his sponsorship of you and your use of the violet flame. Without the violet flame, the only alternative to the balance of karma is the old Hindu tradition of thousands and ten thousands of years of reincarnation. 
and it is so far in the distance that anyone ever gets off of that treadmill that you cease to even worry about it, and this is as bad as the Western civilization that doesn't acknowledge reincarnation at all. Both have the effect of lethargy. So let us see that St. Germain says it's the turning of the age. The ascended masters and the archangels are very close at hand. There are cosmic cycles when the portals of the inner schools, the mystery schools, are opened. And those etheric retreats of the Great White Brotherhood are open today. And you can go there while your bodies sleep at night. You can call to your mighty I Am Presence and the archangels to take your soul while you are asleep to the Royal Teton Retreat, which is in the mountain of the Grand Teton in Wyoming in the United States. It's the foremost retreat of the Great White Brotherhood for those who are engaged in the cause of freedom. It is where the fundamentals are taught. Many people who come to our lectures physically as you are have already been trained there and are thoroughly familiar with what we are saying and only agree in their hearts and say this is something I've always known and you've always known it because you already are students of the ascended masters at inner levels and I come merely as a messenger who is a reminder a reminder of who you are, what you already know, and that it's time to get going, it's time to galvanize ourselves and focus on the issues that are most life-threatening to the people of Earth. If we can't preserve a physical foundation, our nations and our governments in freedom, if we can't have enough food for our people, have a viable economic system and a monetary system, we do not have the platform for our spiritual evolution. Today we have these things. We must safeguard them because we know there are those who lust after the light of our nation, Australia, our nation, America, our nation, Canada. So we understand that we must keep the flame of freedom and liberty, of light and peace and abundance in our nations. Keeping the flame means affirming the sacred fire of God daily by the dynamic decree, not merely meditating. What you meditate on exists in your mind. What you bring to bear through the science of the spoken word is a physical alchemy and you will watch the atoms and cells and electrons of your being change before your very eyes when you realize that the science of the spoken word is the consummation of your meditation. You can learn prayer and meditation directly from Jesus and Kithumi in our book, Prayer and Meditation. But the spoken word is when you start to rearrange your universe. And I bid you great joy in experimenting with that process. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again, for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight be not in winter. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Now the abomination in the temple in the Old Testament had to do with the improper conducting of the rituals of sacrifice, the taking of the meat, the eating of the meat, and the placing, I believe, of the meat of swine. This was considered the abomination of desolation, standing in the holy place where it ought not. Today we have far greater abominations. To name a few, is there anything more abominable than child molesting, child prostitution? Is there anything more abominable than the destruction of the bodies of a whole generation of youth of light bearers to the pied pipers of drugs, destroying the nervous system and the brain and thereby inhibiting the later development of the precious chakras? 
Is there anything more abominable than nuclear war? Is there anything more abominable than the destruction of little children with toys in Afghanistan, where they pick up these toys dropped from Soviet helicopters and planes, and they explode in their hands and they are maimed for life? Is there anything more abominable than the fact that there is hunger on Earth when there is so much food in our nations that it is rotting in the granaries? There are many abominations such as the manipulation of the monetary system so that you can work a whole life and save your money in an ardent sacred labor. And by the manipulation of the price of the dollar, you have lost a lifetime's work. There are many abominations such as the pollution of our body temples, such as our not being able to overcome and resolve the problems of the last plague of cancer, and on and on. I think the abomination of desolation is here. I think the misuse of the name of God I am in all sorts of activities that are destructive and death-leading is a sign that we are in this very hour of the end time. Now it is speaking of the days being shortened for the elect, and except that the days of the outpicturing of this world karma should be shortened, no flesh should be saved. How do we shorten the days? Days are cycles. They are cycles on the cosmic clock. They are cycles of the release of karma. You accelerate your life, your life pattern, with the violet flame and the sacred fire. When you give your daily decrees to the violet flame, you go through your past records quickly, much more quickly than if you had to balance them on a one-to-one -one basis of service to the part of life that has been wronged. Shortening the days can only come by the intercession of the Holy Spirit, and it is upon us. It is the violet flame that is the grace and the dispensation. Now it talks about going to the mountains, it talks about fleeing to those mountains. And whether incidental to or a part of this prophecy, we were led in 1973, at the same year of the departure from us of our beloved teacher and friend, my husband, Mark L. Prophet, to establish for ourselves a retreat, a retreat far from civilization and in the mountains which would be a place to secure the teaching, but also a haven of light for any and all light bearers in the world who would desire to be a part of that retreat in the last days, whose goal is the ascension, whose goal is the balancing of karma and reunion with God, and the desire to make this teaching live so that there will be no dark ages to come in this 2,000-year cycle, that the real core teaching of Christ would live. Today we have 30,000 acres in Montana. You've seen a glimpse of those acres in our film, if you've seen it. It is there, it is the place prepared, it is secured, and we consider that it belongs to every servant of God on earth who desires to be a part of it. If you desire to be there, the great season of building and ranching and farming is from March to October. You are welcome to apply, you are welcome to visit, you are welcome to think about the fact that there is a home and a place that is yours when you are in Australia and I have taken my leave of you. It is next to Yellowstone Park with eight miles and more on the Yellowstone River. It is in the high mountains and the lowest elevation is about 5,000 feet and it goes up to 11,000 feet. We do truck farming and ranching. I was talking to Edward Francis, who is my husband, who is manning that ranch, and he's saying, guess what? There's 70 buffalo outside my window. 70 buffalo. He said they won't move. They can't get them back to the park. They come down from the park because it's lower elevation. And they do like to winter on the ranch. So the Park Service has brought its planes and helicopters to drive them back. You know, they're giants. They make a cow look like a little dog. They will not move. They will not leave the ranch because they have a dormant condition of brucellosis, which can be caught by cattle. The government has taken the step to decide that they must be removed by killing them. 
which has nothing to do with us. It is something that they do when they see that the buffalo threaten the neighboring ranchers, which is a great tragedy. But in any case, those of you who have read about the wild and woolly west and the days of buffalo and Indians, well, they're not gone from Montana. There are a lot of buffalo in that park. So it's a place you can think about. It's a place you can know. I've got a stake in it because I'm keeping the flame of life. And keepers of the flame in America determined that those in every nation would have a place to go to in this time of trouble should it become physical. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take heed, because I have foretold you all things. The signs and wonders of false teachers may be physical signs of all sorts of the manipulation of matter. The masters of the great white brotherhood have said, we will not prove ourselves by signs, but by the confirming of the heart, by the fire of the heart, and by the inner knowledge. And so you will not see that type of manifestation. You will see a true teaching that Christ is in you that you need go nowhere because your inner teacher is with you, but you need the teaching of the law so that you can come into union with that presence. In those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Now these stars that fall are not physical stars. For a long, long time, in the writings of the book of Enoch, the angels who fell, lost their first estate, took embodiment, were cast out of heaven through the war of Archangel Michael. They have been called the stars of heaven. They have fallen, and their falling in this age is the falling from positions of power of those individuals who have usurped the power that belongs to God and his people. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. This is how you will see that Son of Man descending from the light through the clouds of your own higher consciousness. And you will see Christ in his second coming, coming into your temple. The first coming is in the avatar Jesus. The second coming is behold, the I am that I am with you. And that sign of that second coming will also be seen in the physical heavens. But we must understand that our salvation is not outside of us, but that it is within. Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the very doors. This is the sign of the ripening of world karma. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. The generation of the light bearers that were with Jesus, but it's 2,000 years later. And therefore he must be referring to the fact that they reincarnate, they come again, and in this age we will not pass through the gate of heaven until we have settled the accounts and taken Christ's dominion over the earth. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. This is the comfort you have, that if all things fall apart, the word of God in you is the eternal life, and you are secure when you have that word. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. The Father knows all things, he knows the outplaying of cycles. It is not a fixed time because free will is involved. Not predestination, but free will. The actions of the sons and daughters of God on earth make the difference in the cycles and their intensity and whether we have war or not and whether we solve the problems of food and the economy. It is up to us, you see. 
We simply don't wait for things to happen because they are preordained. This is a sick and ignorant mentality. It is not real. Free will in you plus Christ equals the light's descent. The light descends, it consumes the burden, and we can change our history, past, present, and future by becoming instruments of the sacred fire. That is the message of Jesus Christ and the seventh angel, Saint Germain. Take ye heed, watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. We watch, we meditate, we are alert, we clear our chakras, we keep our lamps trimmed with light. We watch the world scene, we watch the signs in the papers, we watch the signs in the burdens of our children, our personal psychology, and we give the dynamic decree upon those things that we observe. We send the light into the very cause and core of the problem. It is not beneath us to send the light of the mighty I am presence into the falling Australian dollar. And we say, in the name of Almighty God, I demand the action of the light into that dollar and the holding of that currency, because it is our money that is losing its value. It's your hard-earned money. It's suddenly losing its value by international events and manipulations. These things ought not to be. We must not allow them. The light of God is great enough to hold steady that currency because Jesus decreed the abundant life for us, and what we are doing is affirming it. You can take any decree in the little books we've given to you, say a prayer that's very specific for a loved one, then recite the decree to gain the momentum of the spoken word for change. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. The Son of Man, there is Christ above you. He has taken leave of your temple while you should exercise free will. He has taken a journey. The far country is the higher consciousness. God has said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Free will. How do we get him back into the temple? We say, not my will, but thine be done. I'm sick and tired of my human free will and what I've done with it. I want God in my temple. Holy Christ self above me, come, be the balance of my soul. Come, enter my temple now. Live in me, use me, let me be yourself, heart, head, and hand. When you make that call, your Christ self enters your temple. Then you go about your business, you do what you're doing, and you begin to get in a vibration that isn't so good. Maybe you feel sorry for yourself. Maybe you get into some old patterns. So now your free will is beginning to reaffirm again your lower consciousness, not your Christ self. So gradually that Christ mind gravitates to the plane of perfection. And suddenly you remember Christ, and yet you do not feel him so very near because your own vibration makes him feel absent. So you pick up your decree book, you start giving the violet flame, you call on the law of forgiveness, and say, not my will, but thine be done. Come back, come into my temple, live through me. I'm going to do better. Every day is a challenge. Who's occupying your temple, that old carnal mind, that old man, or the new creature in Christ? Your free will will do it. God is not a dictator. He will not take over your life unless you join hands with him and be that partner. Because of the covenant of free will, it will not be set aside. Free will is your passport to the kingdom of heaven all the way home. And that's why heaven cannot be guaranteed anyone. Because until we step through the door, we can still take that free will back and create some devastating deed, which is karma making, which binds us to re-embody again. That's why he says, watch and pray. Greater two admonishments were never given. Watch. Watch your actions, watch your thoughts, watch your feelings, watch the world, be the watchman of the night, and pray concerning those things that you see. Do not neglect them, do not ignore them, for the Lord will not hold you guiltless in the day of judgment if you have turned your back on your affairs, your nation, your children, your psychology. You must watch, you must pray. Watch ye therefore. 
For ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. You see, if the Holy Christ self comes to your temple and you have not kept the watch, then the great light of that Christ juxtaposed the darkness of our human consciousness creates calamity. Christ then becomes the instrument perhaps of the return of karma or the descent of disease. So we have to prepare for his coming. He said, occupy till I come. Occupy this temple because I surely will come. And if you are not found in the consciousness of God on the Lord's day, then the accumulation of your karma may be so great that the light itself will precipitate a judgment with which you cannot deal. And this is what we see in the calamities that come upon earth and take people suddenly, and suddenly they are no more. We will all meet our God, either by affirmation and free will, or by that head-on collision with the God who is the lawgiver, and the lawgiver is the manifestation of the law of our karma. Lest this master of the house, lest he come, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. You've been watching The Coming Revolution in Higher Consciousness with Elizabeth Clare Prophet. The preceding public access program has been presented through the assistance of Church Universal and Triumphant, Box A, Malibu, California, 90265. If you would like to know more, call this number or write this address.